Chapter Seven of Skylark Three by E. E. Smith. Chapter Seven: Duquesne's Voyage. Far from our solar system, a cigar-shaped space car slackened its terrific acceleration to a point at which human beings could walk, and two men got up, exercised vigorously to restore the circulation to their numbed bodies, and went into the galley to prepare their meal the first since leaving the earth some eight hours or more before. Because of the long and arduous journey he had decided upon, Duquesne had had to abandon his custom of working alone, and had studied all the available men with great care before selecting his companion and relief pilot. He finally had chosen Baby Doll Loring, so-called because of his curly yellow hair, his pink and white complexion, his guileless blue eyes, his slight form of rather less than medium height but never did outward attributes more belie the inner man. The yellow curls covered a brain agile, keen, and hard. The girlish complexion neither paled nor reddened under stress. The wide blue eyes had glanced along the barrels of so many lethal weapons that in various localities the noose yawned for him. The slender body was built of rawhide and whalebone, and responded instantly to the dictates of that ruthless brain. Under the protection of steel he flourished, and in return for that protection he performed, quietly and with neatness and dispatch, such odd jobs as were in his line with which he was commissioned. When they were seated at an excellent breakfast of ham and eggs, buttered toast and strong aromatic coffee, Duquesne broke the long silence. "'Do you want to know where we are?' I'd say we were a long way from home, by the way this elevator of yours has been climbing all night. We are a good many millions miles from the earth, and we are getting farther away at a rate that would have to be measured in millions of miles per second. Duquesne, watching the other narrowly as he made this startling announcement, and remembering the effects of a similar one upon Perkins, saw with approval that the coffee cup in midair did not pause or waver in its course. Loring noted the bouquet of his beverage, and took an appreciative sip before he replied, "'You certainly can make coffee, doctor, and good coffee is nine-tenths of a good breakfast. As to where we are, that's all right with me. I can stand it if you can. Don't you want to know where we're going, and why?' "'I've been thinking about that. Before we started I didn't want to know anything because what a man doesn't know he can't be accused of spilling in case of a leak. Now that we are on our way, though, maybe I should know enough about things to act intelligently if something unforeseen should develop. If you'd rather keep it dark and give me orders when necessary, that's all right with me, too. It's your party, you know. I brought you along because one man can't stand on duty twenty-four hours a day continuously. Since you are in as deep as you can get, and since this trip is dangerous, you should know everything there is to know. You are one of the higher-ups now, anyway, and we understand each other thoroughly, I believe." I believe so. Back in the bow control room, Duquesne applied more power, but not enough to render movement impossible. You don't have to drive her as hard all the way, then, as you did last night? No. I'm out of range of Seaton's instrument now, and we don't have to kill ourselves. High acceleration is punishment for anyone, and we must keep ourselves fit. To begin with, I suppose that you are curious about that object compass? That and other things. An object compass is a needle of specially treated copper, so activated that it points always toward one certain object after being once set upon it. Seaton undoubtedly has one upon me, but, sensitive as they are, they can't hold on a mass as small as a man at this distance. That was why we left at midnight after he had gone to bed, so that we'd be out of range before he woke up. I wanted to lose him, as he might interfere if he knew where I was going. Now I'll go back to the beginning and tell you the whole story. Tersely but vividly he recounted the tale of the interstellar cruise the voyage of the Skylark of space. When he had finished, Loring smoked for a few minutes in silence. There's a lot of stuff there that's hard to understand all at once. 
Do you mind if I ask a few foolish questions to get things straightened out in my mind? Go ahead. Ask as many as you want to. It's hard to understand a lot of that Osnomian stuff. A man can't get it all at once. Osnome is so far away. How are you going to find it? With one of the object compasses I mentioned. I had planned on navigating from notes I took on the ship back to Earth, but it wasn't necessary. They tried to keep me from finding out anything, but I learned all about the compasses, built a few of them in their own shop, and set one on Osnome. I had it, among other things, in my pocket when I landed. In fact, the control of that explosive copper bullet is the only thing they had that I wasn't able to get, and I'll get that on this trip. What is that Aranac armor they're wearing? Aranac is a synthetic metal, almost perfectly transparent. It has practically the same refractive index as air, therefore it is, to all intents and purposes, invisible. It's about five hundred times as strong as chrome vanadium steel, and even when you've got it to the yield point, it doesn't break, but stretches out and snaps back like rubber with the strength unimpaired. It's the most wonderful thing I saw on the whole trip. They make complete suits of it. Of course, they aren't very comfortable, but since they are only a tenth of an inch, they can be worn. And a tenth of an inch of that stuff will stop a steel-nosed machine-gun bullet? Stop it! <laughs> a tenth of an inch of Aranac is harder to pierce than fifty inches of our hardest, toughest armor steel. A sixteenth-inch armor-piercing projectile couldn't get through it. It's hard to believe, but nevertheless it's a fact. The only way to kill Seaton with a gun would be to use one heavy enough so that the shock of the impact would kill him, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit if he had his armor anchored with an attractor against that very contingency. But even if he has it, you can imagine the chance of getting action against him with a gun of that size. Yes, I've heard that he is fast. That doesn't tell half of it. You know that I'm handy with a gun myself. You're faster than I am, and that's saying something. You're chain lightning. Well, Seaton is at least that much faster than I am. You've never seen him work. I have. On that Osnomian dock he shot twice before I started, and shot twice to my once from then on. I must have been shooting a quarter of a second after he had his side all cleaned up. To make it worse, I missed once with my left hand. He didn't. There's absolutely no use tackling Richard Seaton without an Osnomian ray generator or something better, but, as you know, Brookings has always been and always will be a fool. He won't believe anything new until after he has actually been shown. Well, I imagine he will be shown plenty by this evening. Well, I'll never tackle him with heat. How does he get that way? He's naturally fast, and has practiced sleight-of-hand work ever since he was a kid. He's one of the best amateur magicians in the country, and I will say that his ability along that line has come in handy for him more than once. I see where you're right in wanting to get something since we have only ordinary weapons and they have all that stuff. This trip is to get a little something for ourselves, I take it? Exactly. And you know enough now to understand what we are out here to get for ourselves. You have guessed that we are headed for Osnome? I suspected it. However, if you were going only to Osnome, you would have gone alone, so I also suspect that that's only half of it. I have no idea what it is, but you've got something else on your mind. You're right. I knew you were keen. When I was on Osnome I found out something that only four other men, all dead, ever knew. There is a race of men far ahead of the Osnomian in science, particularly in warfare. They live a long way beyond Osnome. It is my plan to steal an Osnomian airship and mount all its ray screens, generators, guns, and everything else upon this ship, or else convert their vessel into a spaceship. Instead of using their ordinary power, however, we will do as Seaton did, and use intra-atomic power, which is practically infinite. 
Then we'll have everything Seaton's got. But that isn't enough. I want enough more than he's got to wipe him out. Therefore, after we get a ship armed to suit us, we'll visit this strange planet and either come to terms with them or else steal a ship from them. Then we'll have their stuff and that of the Osnomians as well as our own. Seaton won't last long after that. Do you mind if I ask how you got that dope? Not at all. Except when right with Seaton, I could do pretty much as I pleased, and I used to take long walks for exercise. The Osnomians tired very easily, being so weak, and because of the light gravity of the planet I had to do a lot of work or walking to keep in any kind of condition at all. I learned Condalian quickly, and got so friendly with the guards that pretty soon they quit trying to keep me in sight, but waited at the edge of the palace grounds until I came back and joined them. Well, one trip I was fifteen miles or so from the city, when an airship crashed down in a woods about half a mile from me. It was in an uninhabited district and nobody else saw it. I went over to investigate, thinking probably I could find out something useful. It had the whole front end cut or broken off, and that made me curious, because no imaginable fall will break an Aranac hull. I walked in through the hole and saw that it was one of their fighting tenders, a combination warship and repair shop, with all of the stuff in it that I've been telling you about. The generators were mostly burned out, and the propelling and lifting motors were out of commission. I prowled around, getting acquainted with it, and found a lot of useful instruments, and, best of all, one of Dunark's new mechanical educators with complete instructions for its use. Also I found three bodies and thought I'd try it out. Just a minute. Only three bodies on a warship? And what good could a mechanical educator do if the men were all dead? Three is all I found, but there was another one. Three men and a captain compose an Osnomian crew for any ordinary vessel. Everything is automatic, you know. As for the men being dead, that doesn't make any difference. You can read their brains just the same if they haven't been dead too long. However, when I tried to read theirs, I found only blanks. Their brains had been destroyed so that nobody could read them. That did look funny so I ransacked the ship from truck to keelson, and finally found another body wearing an air helmet in a sort of closet off the control room. I put the educator on it. This is getting good. It sounds like a page of the old Arabian Nights that I used to read when I was a boy. You know, it really isn't surprising that Brookings didn't believe a lot of this stuff. As I have said, a lot of it is hard to understand, but I'm going to show it to you. All that and more. Okay, I believe it all right. After riding in this boat and looking out of the windows, I'll believe anything. Reading a dead man's brain is steep, though. I'll let you do it after we get there. I don't understand exactly how it works myself, but I know how to operate one. Well, I found out that this man's brain was in good shape, and I got a shock when I read it. Here's what he had been through. They had been flying very high on their way to the front when their ship was seized by an invisible force and thrown upward. He must have thought faster than the others because he put on an air helmet and dived into this locker where he hid under a pile of gear, fixing things so that he could see out through the transparent aeronach of the wall. No sooner was he hidden that the front end of the ship went up in a blaze of light in spite of their race screens going full blast. They were up so high by that time that when the bow was burned off, the other three fainted from lack of air. Then their generators went out, and pretty soon two peculiar-looking strangers entered. They were wearing vacuum suits and were very short and stocky, giving the impression of enormous strength. They brought an educator of their own with them and read the brains of the three men. Then they dropped the ship a few thousand feet and revived the three with a drink of something out of a flask. Must have been different from the kind handled by most booties I know, then. The stuff we've been getting lately would make a man more unconscious than ever. 
Some powerful drug, probably, but the Osnomian didn't know anything about it. After the men were revived, the strangers, apparently from sheer cruelty and love of torturing their victims, informed them in the Osnomian language that they were from another world on the far edge of the galaxy. They even told them, knowing that the Osnomians knew nothing of astronomy, exactly where they were from. Then they went on to say that they wanted the entire green system for themselves, and that in something like two years of our time they were going to wipe out all the present inhabitants of the system and take it over as a base for future operations. After that they amused themselves by describing exactly the kinds of death and destruction they were going to use. They described most of it in great detail. It's too involved to tell you about now. But they've got rays, generators, and screens that even the Osnomians never heard of. And, of course, they've got intra-atomic energy the same as we have. After telling them all this and watching them suffer, they put a machine on their heads and they dropped dead. That's probably what disintegrated their brains. Then they looked the ship over, rather casually, as though they didn't see anything they were interested in, crippled the motors, and went away. The vessel was then released, and crashed. The man, of course, was killed by the fall. I buried the men, I didn't want anyone else reading that brain, hit some of the stuff I wanted most, and camouflaged the ship, so that I'm fairly sure that it's there yet. I decided then to make this trip. I see. Loring's mind was grappling with these new and strange facts. That news is staggering, Doctor. Think of it. Everybody thinks our own world is everything there is. Our world is simply a grain of dust in the universe. Most people know it academically, but very few ever give the fact any actual consideration. But now that you've had a little time to get used to the idea of there being other worlds, and some of them as far ahead of us in science as we are ahead of the monkeys, what do you think of it? I agree with you that we've got their stuff said Loring. However, it occurs to me as a possibility that they may have so much stuff that we won't be able to make the approach. However, if the Osnomian fittings we are going to get are as good as you say they are, I think that two such men as you and I can get at least a lunch, while any other crew, no matter who they are, are getting a square meal. I like your style, Loring. You and I will have the world eating out of our hands shortly after we get back. As far as actual procedure over there is concerned, of course, I haven't made any definite plans. We'll have to size up the situation after we get there before we can know exactly what we'll have to do. However, we are not coming back empty-handed. You said something, Chief. And the two men, so startlingly unlike physically, but so alike inwardly, shook hands in token of their mutual dedication to a single purpose. Loring was then instructed in the simple navigation of the ship of space, and thereafter the two men took their regular shifts at the controls. In due time they approached Osnome, and Duquesne studied the planet carefully through a telescope before he ventured down into the atmosphere. This half of it used to be Mardanil. I suppose it's all Condal now. No, there's a war on down there yet. At least there's a disturbance of some kind, and on this planet that means war. What are you looking for exactly? asked Loring, who was also examining the terrain with a telescope. They've got some spherical spaceships like Seton's. I know they had one, and they've probably built more of them since that time. Their airships couldn't touch us, but those ball-shaped cruisers would be pure poison for us the way we're fixed now. Can you see any of them? Not yet. Too far away to make out details. They're certainly having a hot time down there, though, in that one spot. They dropped lower toward the stronghold which was being so stubbornly defended by the inhabitants of the third planet of the fourteenth sun, and so savagely attacked by the Condalian forces. There. We can see what they're doing now. And Duquesne anchored the vessel with an attractor. I want to see if they've got many of those spaceships in action, and you will want to see what war is like when it's fought by people who have been making war steadily for ten thousand years." Poised at the limit of clear visibility, 
The two men studied the incessant battle being waged beneath them. They saw not one, but fully a thousand of the globular craft high in the air and grouped in a great circle around an immense fortification upon the ground below. They saw no airships in the line of battle, but noticed that many such vessels were flying to and from the front, apparently carrying supplies. The fortress was an immense dome of some glassy, transparent material, partially covered with slag, through which they saw that the central space was occupied by orderly groups of barracks, and that round the circumference were arranged gigantic generators, projectors, and other machinery at whose purposes they could not even guess. From the base of the dome a twenty-mile-wide apron of the same glassy substance spread over the ground, and above this apron and all around the dome were thrown the mighty defensive ray-screens, visible now and then in scintillating violet splendor as one of the copper-driven condelian projectors sought in vain for an opening. But the earthmen saw with surprise that the main attack was not being directed at the dome that only an occasional ray was thrown against it in order to make the defenders keep their screens up continuously. The edge of that apron was bearing the brunt of that vicious and never-ceasing attack, and most concerned the desperate defense. For miles beyond that edge, and as deep under it as frightful rays and enormous charges of explosive copper could penetrate, the ground was one seething, flaming volcano of molten and incandescent lava, lava constantly being volatilized by the unimaginable heat of those rays, and being hurled for miles in all directions by the inconceivable power of those explosive copper projectiles. The heaviest projectiles that could be used without endangering the planet itself being directed under the exposed edge of that unbreakable apron which was in actuality anchored to the solid core of the planet itself, lava flowing into and filling up the vast craters caused by the explosions. The attack seemed fiercest at certain points, perhaps a quarter of a mile apart around the circle, and after a time the watchers perceived that at those points, under the edge of the apron, in that indescribable inferno of boiling lava, destructive rays and disintegrating copper, there were enemy machines at work. These machines were strengthening the projecting apron and extending it very slowly, but ever wider and ever deeper, as the ground under it and before it was volatilized or hurled away by the awful forces of the Condalian attack. So much destruction had already been wrought that the edge of the apron and its molten moat were already fully a mile below the normal level of that cratered, torn, and tortured plain. Even as they watched, one of the spheres, unable for some reason to maintain its screens or overcome by the awful forces playing upon it, flared from white into and through the violet and was hurled upward as though shot from the mouth of some Brobdingnagian howitzer. A door opened, and from its flaming interior four figures leaped out into the air, followed by a puff of orange-colored smoke. At the first sign of trouble the ship next it in line leaped in front of it and the four figures floated gently to the ground, supported by friendly attractors, and protected from enemy rays by the bulk and by the screens of the rescuing vessel. Two great airships soared upward from back of the lines and hauled the disabled vessel to the ground by means of their powerful attractors. The two observers saw with amazement that, after brief attention from an ant-like ground crew, the original four men climbed back into their warship and she again shot into the fray, apparently as good as ever. "'What do you know about that?' exclaimed Duquesne. "'That gives me an idea, Loring. They must get to them that way fairly often, to judge by the teamwork they use when it does happen. How about waiting until they disable another one like that, and then grabbing it while it's in the air, deserted and unable to fight back? One of those ships is worth a thousand of this one, even if we had everything known to the Osnomians. "'That's a real idea. Those boats certainly are brutes for punishment,' agreed Loring, and as both men again settled down to watch the battle, he went on. "'So this is war out this way? You're right. Seaton, with half this stuff, could whip the combined armies and navies of the world. I don't blame Brookings much, though, at that, 
Nobody could believe half of this unless they could actually see it, as we are doing. I can't understand it, Duquesne frowned as he considered the situation. The attackers are Condylians, all right. Those ships are developments of the Skylark. But I don't get that fort at all. Wonder if it can be the strangers already? Don't think so. They aren't due for a couple of years yet. And I don't think the Condylians could stand against them a minute. It must be what is left of Mardinale, although I never heard of anything like that. Probably it is some new invention they dug up at the last minute. That's it, I guess. And his brow cleared. It couldn't be anything else. They waited long for the incident to be repeated, and finally their patience was rewarded. When the next vessel was disabled and hurled upward by the concentration of enemy forces, Duquesne darted down, seized it with his most powerful attractor, and whisked it away into space at such a velocity that to the eyes of the Condalians it simply disappeared. He took the disabled warship far out into space and allowed it to cool for a long time before deciding that it was safe to board it. Through the transparent walls they could see no sign of life, and Duquesne donned a vacuum suit and stepped into the airlock. As Loring held the steel vessel close to the stranger, Duquesne leaped lightly through the open door into the interior. Shutting the door, he opened an auxiliary air tank, adjusting the gauge to one atmosphere as he did so. The pressure normal, he divested himself of the suit and made a thorough examination of the vessel. He then signaled Loring to follow him, and soon both ships were over Condal, so high as to be invisible from the ground. Plunging the vessel like a bullet toward the grove in which he had left the Condalian airship, he slowed abruptly just in time to make a safe landing. As he stepped out upon Osnomian soil, Loring landed the earthly ship hardly less skillfully. This saves us a lot of trouble, Loring. This is undoubtedly one of the finest spaceships of the universe and just about ready for anything. How did they get to it? One of the screen generators apparently weakened a trifle, probably from weeks of continuous use. That let some of the rays come through, everything got hot, and the crew had to jump or roast. Nothing is hurt, though, as the ship was thrown up and out of range before the Aranac melted at all. The copper repellers are gone, of course, and most of the bars that were in use are melted down, but there was enough of the main bar left to drive the ship, and we can replace the melted stuff easily enough. Nothing else was hurt, as there's absolutely nothing in the structure of these vessels that can be burned. Even the insulation in the coils and generators has a melting point higher than that of porcelain. And not all the copper was melted, either. Some of these storerooms are lined with two feet of insulation, and are piled full of bars and explosive ammunition. What was that smoke we saw, then? That was their food supply. It cooked to ash, and their water was all boiled away through the safety valves. Those rays certainly can put out a lot of heat in a second or two. Can the two of us put on those copper repeller bands? This ship must be seventy-five feet in diameter. Yes, it's a lot bigger than the Skylark was. It's one of their latest models, or it wouldn't have been on the front line. As to banding on the repellers, that's easy. That airship is half full of metalworking machinery that can do everything but talk. I know how to use most of it from seeing it in use, and we can figure out the rest. In that unfrequented spot there was little danger of detection from the air, and none whatsoever of detection from the ground. Of ground travel upon Osnome there is none. Nevertheless, the two men camouflaged the vessel so that they were visible only to keen and direct scrutiny, and drove their task through to completion on the shortest possible time. The copper repellers were banded on, and much additional machinery was installed in the already well-equipped shop. This done, they transferred to their warship food, water, bedding, instruments, and everything else they needed or wanted from their own ship and from the disabled Condalian airship. They made a last tour of inspection to be sure they had overlooked nothing useful, then embarked. Think anybody will find those ships? They could get a good line on what we've done. Probably eventually Loring, so we'd better destroy them. 
We'd better take a short hop first, though, to test everything out. Since you're not familiar with the controls of a ship of this type, you need practice. Shoot us up around that moon over there and bring us back to this spot. She's a sweet handling boat, easy like a bicycle, declared Loring, as he brought the vessel lightly to a landing upon their return. We can burn the old one up now. We'll never need her again, any more than a snake needs his last year's skin. She's good, all right. Those two hulks must be put out of existence, but we shouldn't do it here. The rays would set the woods afire, and the metal would condense all around. We don't want to leave any tracks, so we'd better pull them out into space to destroy them. We could turn them loose, and as you've never worked a ray, it'll be good practice for you. Also, I want you to see for yourself just what our best armor plate amounts to compared with Aranach. When they towed the two vessels far out into space, Loring put into practice the instruction he had received from Duquesne concerning the complex armament of their vessel. He swung the beam projector upon the Condalian airship, pressed the connectors of the softener ray, the heat ray, and the induction ray, and threw the master switch. Almost instantly the entire hull became blinding white but it was several seconds before the extremely refractory material began to volatize. Though the metal was less than an inch thick, it retained its shape and strength stubbornly, and only slowly did it disappear in flaming, flaring gusts of incandescent gas. "'There, you see what an inch of Aranac is like,' said Duquesne, when the destruction was complete. Now shine it on that sixty-inch chrome vanadium armor hull of our old bus and see what happens." Loring did so. As the beam touched it, the steel disappeared in one flare of radiance. As he swung the projector in one flashing arc from the stem to the stern, there was nothing left. Loring, swinging the beam, whistled in amazement. Wow! What a difference! And this ship of ours has a skin of Aranex six feet thick? Yes. Now you understand why I didn't want to argue with anybody out here as long as we were in our steel ship. I understand all right, but I can't understand the power of these rays. Suppose I had all twenty of them on instead of only three. In that case I think we could have whipped even the short, thick strangers. You and me both. But say, every ship's got to have a name. This new one of ours is such a sweet, harmless, inoffensive little thing. We'd better name her the Violet, hadn't we?" Duquesne started the Violet off in the direction of the solar system occupied by the warlike strangers, but he did not hurry. He and Loring practiced incessantly for days at the controls, darting here and there putting on terrific acceleration until the indicator showed a velocity of hundreds of thousands of miles per second, then reversing the acceleration until the velocity was zero. They studied the controls and alarm system until each knew perfectly every instrument, every tiny light, and the tone of each bell. They practiced with the rays, singly and in combination, with the visiplates, and with the many levers and dials until each was so familiar with the complex installation that his handling of every control had become automatic. Not until then did Duquesne give the word to start out in earnest toward their goal at an unthinkable distance. They had not been under way long when an alarm bell sounded its warning and a brilliant green light began flashing upon the board. Hmm, Duquesne frowned as he reversed the bar. Outside intra-atomic energy detector, somebody's using power out here. Direction about dead ahead, straight down. Let's see if we can see anything. He swung number six, the telescopic visiplate, into connection. After what seemed to them a long time, they saw a sudden sharp flash, apparently an immense distance ahead, and simultaneously three more alarm bells rang and three colored lights flashed briefly. Somebody got quite a jolt, then. Three rays in action at once for three or four seconds, reported Duquesne, as he applied still more negative acceleration. I'd like to know what this is all about, he exclaimed after a time as they saw a subdued glow which lasted a minute or two. As the warning lights were flashing more and more slowly and with diminishing intensity, 
the violet was once more put upon her course. As she proceeded, however, the warnings of the liberation of intra-atomic energy grew stronger and stronger, and both men scanned their path intensely for a sight of the source of the disturbance, while their velocity was cut to only a few hundred miles an hour. Suddenly the indicator swerved and pointed behind them, showing that they had passed the object, whatever it was. Duquesne instantly applied power and snapped on a small searchlight. If it's so small that we couldn't see it when we passed it, it's nothing to be afraid of. We'll be able to find it with light. After a search, they saw an object floating in space, apparently a vacuum suit. Shall one of us get in the airlock, or shall we bring it in with an attractor? asked Loring. An attractor, by all means. Two or three of them, in fact, to spread eagle whatever it is. Never take any chances. It's probably an Osnomian, but you never can tell. It may be one of those other people. We know they were around here a few weeks ago, and they're the only ones I know of that have intra-atomic power besides us and the Osnomians." "'That's no Osnomian,' he continued, as the stranger was drawn into the airlock. "'He's big enough around for four Osnomians, and very short. We'll take no chances at all with that fellow.' The captive was brought into the control room, pinioned head, hand and foot, with attractors and repellers. Before Duquesne approached him, he then read the temperature and pressure of the stranger's air supply, and allowed the surplus air to escape slowly before removing the stranger's suit and revealing one of the fenachrone, eyes closed, unconscious or dead. Duquesne leaped for the educator and handed Loring a headset. Put this on, quick. He may be only unconscious, and we might not be able to get a thing from him if he were awake." Loring donned the headset, still staring at the monstrous form with amazement, not unmixed with awe, while Duquesne, paying no attention to anything except the knowledge he was seeking, manipulated the controls of the instrument. His first quest was for the weapons and armament of the vessel. In this he was disappointed as he learned that the stranger was one of the navigating engineers, and as such had no detailed knowledge of the matters of prime importance to the Inquisitor. He did have a complete knowledge of the marvelous fenachrone propulsion system, however, and this Duquesne carefully transferred to his own brain. He then rapidly explored other regions of that fearsome organ of thought. As the gigantic and inhuman brain was spread before them, Duquesne and Loring read not only the language, customs, and culture of the Fenachrone, but all their plans for the future, as well as the events of the past. Plainly in his mind they perceived how he had been cast adrift in the emptiness of the void. They saw the Fenachrone cruiser lying in wait for the two globular vessels, looking through an extraordinarily powerful telescope with the eyes of their prisoner. They saw them approach, all unsuspecting. Duquesne recognized all five persons in the Skylark and Dunark and Setar in the Condal. Such was that unearthly optical instrument, and so clear was the impression upon the mind before him. They saw the attack and the battle. They saw the Skylark throw off her zone of force and attack. Saw this one survivor standing directly in line with a huge projector spring, and saw the spring severed by the zone. The free end, under its thousands of pounds of tension, had struck the being upon the side of the head, and the force of the blow, only partially blocked by the heavy helmet, had hurled him out through the yawning gap in the wall and hundreds of miles out into space. Suddenly the clear view of the brain of the Fenachrone became blurred and meaningless, and the flow of knowledge ceased. The prisoner had regained consciousness and was trying with all his gigantic strength to break from those intangible bonds that held him. So powerful were the forces upon him, however, that only a few twitching muscles gave evidence that he was struggling at all. Glancing about him, he recognized the attractors and repellers bearing upon him, ceased his efforts to escape, and hurled the full power of his baleful gaze into the black eyes so close to his own. But Duquesne's mind, always under perfect control, and now amply reinforced by a considerable proportion of the stranger's own knowledge and power, did not waver under the force of even that hypnotic glare. "'It is useless, as you observe,' he said coldly in the stranger's own tongue, and sneered. "'You are perfectly helpless. 
Unlike you of the Fenachrone, however, men of my race do not always kill strangers at sight merely because they are strangers. I will spare your life if you can give me anything of enough value to me to make extra time and trouble worthwhile. You read my mind while I could not resist your childish efforts. I will have no traffic whatever with you who have destroyed my vessel. If you have mentality enough to understand any portion of my mind, which I doubt, you already know the fate in store for you. Do with me what you will. This from the stranger. Duquesne pondered long before he replied considering whether it was to his advantage to inform this stranger of the facts. Finally, he decided, Sir, neither I nor this vessel had anything to do with the destruction of your warship. Our detectors discovered you floating in empty space. We stopped and rescued you from death. We have seen nothing else save what we saw pictured in your own brain. I know that, in common with all of your race, you possess neither conscience nor honor as we understand the terms. An automatic liar by instinct and training, whenever you think lies will best serve your purpose, you may yet have intelligence enough to recognize simple truth when you hear it. You already have observed that we are of the same race as those who destroyed your vessel, and have assumed that we are with them. In that you are wrong. It is true that I am acquainted with those others, but they are my enemies. I am here to kill them not to aid them. You have already helped me in one way. I know as much as does my enemy concerning the impenetrable shield of force. If I will return you unharmed to your own planet, will you assist me in stealing one of your ships of space, so that I may destroy that earth vessel?" The Fenachrone, paying no attention to Duquesne's barbed comments concerning his honor and veracity, did not hesitate an instant in his reply. I will not. We supermen of the Fenachrone will allow no vessel of ours, with its secrets unknown to any others of the universe, to fall into the hands of any of the lesser breeds of men. Well, you didn't try to lie that time, anyway, said Duquesne. But think a minute. Seaton, my enemy, already has one of your vessels. Don't think he is too much of a fool to put it back together and to learn its every secret. Then, too, remember that I have your mind and can get along without you, even though I am willing to admit that you could be of enough help to me so that I could save your life in exchange for that help. Also remember that Superman, though you may be, your mentality cannot cope with the forces I have bearing upon you. Neither will your being a superman enable your body to retain life after I have pushed you through yonder door, dressed as you are in a silken tunic. I have the normal love of life, was the reply, but some things cannot be done even with life at stake. Stealing a vessel of the Fenachrone is one of those things. I can, however, do this much. If you will return me to my own planet, you too shall be received as guests aboard one of our vessels, and shall be allowed to witness the vengeance of the Fenachrone upon your enemy. Then you shall be returned to your vessel and allowed to depart unharmed. Now you are lying by rote. I know just what you'd do, said Duquesne. Get that idea out of your head right now. The attractors now holding you will not be released until after you have told all. Then and then only will we try to discover a way of returning you to your own world safely, and yet in a manner which will in no way jeopardize my own safety. Incidentally, I warn you that the first sign of any attempt to play false with me in any way will mean your instant death." The prisoner remained silent, analyzing every feature of the situation, and Duquesne continued, coldly, Here's something else for you to think about. If you are unwilling to help us, what is to prevent me from killing you and then hunting up Seaton and making peace with him for the duration of this forthcoming war? With the fragments of your vessel, which he has, with my knowledge of your mind reinforced by your own dead brain, 
and with the vast resources of all the planets of the green system, there is no doubt that the plans of the Fenachrone will be seriously interfered with. Myriads of your race will certainly lose their lives, and it is quite possible that your entire race would be destroyed. Understand that I care nothing for the green system. You are welcome to it if you do as I ask. If you do not, I shall warn them and help them simply to protect my world, which is now my own personal property. Then return for our armament and equipment. You promise not to warn the green system against us? The death of your enemy takes first place in your mind? The stranger spoke thoughtfully. In that I understand your viewpoint thoroughly. But after I have remodeled your power plant into ours, and have piloted you to our planet, what assurance have I that you will liberate me, as you have said? None whatever. I have made and am asking no promises, since I cannot expect you to trust me any more than I can trust you. Enough of this argument. I am master here, and I am dictating terms. We can get along without you. Therefore you must decide quickly whether you would rather die suddenly and surely here in space and right now, or help us, as I demand, and live until you get back home, enjoying meanwhile your life and whatever chance you think you may have of being liberated within the atmosphere of your own planet." "'Just a minute, Chief,' Loring said in English, his back to the prisoner. "'Wouldn't we gain more by killing him and going back to Seton in the green system, as you suggested?' No. Duquesne also turned away to shield his features from the mind-reading gaze of the Fenachrone. That was pure bluff. I don't want to get within a million miles of Seton until after we have the armament of this fellow's ships. I couldn't make peace with Seton now, even if I wanted to, and I haven't the slightest intention of trying. I intend killing him on sight. Here's what we're going to do. First we'll get what we came after. Then we'll find the Skylark and blow her clear out of space and take over the pieces of that Fenachrone ship. After that we'll head for the green system, and with their own stuff and what we'll give them, they'll be able to give those fiends a hot reception. By the time they finally destroy the Osnomians, if they do, we'll have the world ready for them." He turned to the Fenachrone. "'What is your decision?' "'I submit in the hope that you will keep your promise, since there is no alternative but death." And the awful creature, still loosely held by the attractors and carefully watched by Duquesne and Loring, fairly tore into the task of rebuilding the Osnomian power plant into the space-annihilating drive of the Fenachrone, for he well knew one fact that Duquesne's hurried inspection had failed to glean from the labyrinthine intricacies of that fearsome brain that once within the detector screens of that distant solar system, these earth beings would be utterly helpless before the forces which would inevitably be turned upon them. Also he realized that time was precious, and resolved to drive the Violet so unmercifully that she would overtake that fleeing torpedo, now many hours upon its way. The torpedo bearing news, for the first time in Fenachrone history, of the overwhelming defeat and capture of one of its mighty engines of interstellar war. In a very short time, considering the complexity of the undertaking, the conversion of the power plant was done, and the repellers, already supposed the ultimate in protection, were reinforced by a ten-thousand-pound mass of activated copper, effective for untold millions of miles. Their monstrous pilot then set the bar and advanced both levers of the dual power control out to the extreme limit of their travel. There was no sense of motion or of acceleration, since the new system of propulsion acted upon every molecule of matter within the radius of activity of the bar, which had been set to include the entire hull. The passengers felt only the utter lack of all weight and the other peculiar sensations with which they were already familiar, as each had had previous experience of free motion in space. But in spite of the lack of apparent motion, the Violet was now leaping through the unfathomable depths of interstellar space with the unthinkable speed of five times the velocity of light. End of chapter 7